which is really cool. So um, let's just dive right in. So why Cassandra and Kubernetes? I mean, it's it's funny because the answer I get most time is, well, we run a lot of Kubernetes, but we don't run Cassandra in it. And that's perfectly fine. Um, the uh, This is the world we live in, right? Here's behold the cluster. Everyone loves this thing, right? Well, on one side you get this, distributed and shared nothing, you know, and that's pretty amazing, yes. But on the other side, you get the configuration and coordination problems that go with it. And you know that when you're deploying a Cassandra cluster, lots of things can go wrong really fast. And <laughs> um, here's, has anyone ever done this? Have you ever deployed a 100 node cluster or even like a two node cluster manually? Yeah what normally happens in that case? I mean, because we're all humans, right? You get that one node that has a fat finger config. That's a bummer. Um, and, and it probably will be on fire for some reason. Like, why is this one node acting bizarrely? And it's because I, I manually changed the configuration and I'm a human. So the more we get uh, non-human interactions with our clusters, the better off we're going to be in the long run. Um, I, I, uh, when I was an undergraduate studying how to build databases, um, I had a professor who said progress in technology is when we have the ability to be more lazy. Let that sink in. I love being lazy. So this is what we've done to be more lazy, right? We started out in the in the good old days when we did the, uh, traditional deployments. Um, you know, take a tarball, maybe a package, maybe, and use SD, SDP, um, VI, edit some files. Everything was bare metal. Yay, let's rack up some equipment. And then eventually we got into this world of virtualization uh, that let us do some things like where we create images, you know, where we, the gold, the gold image of, uh, using VMDKs or um, like in, in the clouds, we use AMIs and, and at least let us bundle things up. And so it's consistent in some way, um, but we're, you know, we did other things and now containers, right? And, you know, it's with containers, you're probably using Docker and Docker and Docker and Docker. And I know everyone, I can just, I don't need any of the angry typing. What about LXC? Um, yeah, those, there are other ones out there, but you know, Docker kind of set the, the pace. But containers are a wonderful way to deploy an application for lots of reasons. And it's standardized the way we've done infrastructure, especially in data infrastructure. But we've also done this business where we've layered on all this declarative infrastructure. Um, Bash was, <laughs> I saw, I showed this picture to uh, Jonathan Ellis and he says, so what you're saying is in the beginning was Bash. Yes, yes, I am saying that. And it was good. Um, that's what we used, right? Bash. And along the way we figured, oh, we need to put some programming around this. So Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt, and then there's tools like OpCenter, Terraform, um, So yeah, there's a lot to going on here. Can anybody hear me? I just got someone slacking me saying they can't hear me. Okay. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Man, you know what a panic moment that is? Nate, Nate. You need to stop doing this to me. He probably did this to me on purpose. When you're sitting there, I just talked for five minutes and then no one heard me, Ugh. this is why we should be in New Orleans, right? <laughs> oh, there is some, there's some real classic funny people in here. This is why we can't have nice conferences, people. All right, fine. Nate, I'm on. So back to where were we? Where were we? Oh yes, deploying infrastructure. Terraform is cool kid. Cloud formation, if you're into the cloudy madness of it all. Um, <clears throat> but what is it all leading to? Dun, 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 Kubernetes. And the reason we're, we're seem to be doing this as a 
is an organization around the world of people who deploy data infrastructure is because Kubernetes is orchestrating the thing that we all decided that we like to use, uh, containers. And there are, have been multiple ways to orchestrate containers. Kubernetes, just one. I'm going to declare that. Um, and the adoption rate on Kubernetes is just taking off like crazy and for good reasons. What's fascinating to me is that Kubernetes, and this is something I've studied quite a bit over the past year, is where is Kubernetes in respect to data infrastructure? And they're really not joined well together right now. And the reason is, is because we solved um, deploying large-scale data infrastructure way before Kubernetes was even a glimmer in the Borg's eye. See what I did there? Um, but that that problem now is coming, we're coming to a head. The things are changing. So we deployed a lot of application infrastructure using various methods, meaning all the top layers, the microservices, the, um, the load balancers, that sort of thing. But we're coming, it's coming due. And what is it about Cassandra that fits into this world? Well, I don't know if y'all saw this. This is a really cool survey. This is now on the uh, cassandra.apachedor.org website. Um, and it was just a, a state of Cassandra users um, survey. And there's there some really cool information in here. But, you know, I, I put this graph on here. Important reasons to love or to use Cassandra. You know, right at the top there, the stuff that we expect to see, it's like great for hybrid. You know, it can use, pretty much use it anywhere. Um, very secure. I was actually surprised by that. And uh, highly scalable. I thought that would be at the top. But down at the very bottom, wah, wah, easy to operate. And so what it says to me is, love Cassandra. Eh, I don't like to operate it as much. Now, I know, I talked to all, a lot of folks. Once you get to used to having to run in Cassandra and you're, you're good at it, it's not that hard. It does have things that bug you. And I think that a lot of that is, if you look at what's happening in 4.0 right now, that's a whole lot of anger at not having to care and feed uh, Cassandra. Um, and that's great. But the basic operations can be pretty tough. And it's not just a Cassandra problem. So we built distributed data operations for years. I mean, I, I deployed plenty of Hadoop uh, and Kafka and Cassandra and a lot of other distributed data, um, data infrastructure in my day. And I used a lot of different things to do it. Like for instance, Yarn. Um, and when we, when we did that, we, we created, I think this is huge mass. Well, declarative application infrastructure was later in this whole thing. And here we are in 2020, trigger warning, sorry, it is still 2020, but I think we're at the point where now where these things that were on different trajectories are starting to come together and data ops, folks who do data ops are looking to become more cloud native. And the reason being is because it's easier to work with in that way. But what are the challenges with Cassandra and Kubernetes? Well, there's three problem classes that I'm going to point out. Um, topology, networking, and storage. Of course, like what else is left? Um, so from a Kubernetes standpoint, because it's trying to orchestrate all these containers, it's looking to just pack things in and be super efficient. And that is great when you're running a Node.js server, but not so great when you're running a Cassandra server. Because Cassandra's like, no, 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 no. I have my own version of how things should be. And I'm distributing my data for maximum availability. And by the way, I probably want to take the entire machine with me. And that's great. I mean, that's what Cassandra is supposed to do. But these two things clash quite a bit. Uh, the way Kubernetes sees distributed and the way Cassandra sees, sees things distributed don't exactly match. So when it comes to networking, uh, if you've ever had the privilege of trying to make Kubernetes networking a thing, um, you will understand the statement. Every cluster is an island. <laughs> and it's meant to be that way. Um, it's this security bliss where you just like, of course it's secure. No one could get to it. Um, what was the old NSA red book? The most secure computer is the one that's off. <laughs> so they kind of took that, right? But the Cassandra world, we see yeah, there's a really in strong need for those Cassandra nodes to see each other, especially across multiple data centers. And 
the, all the ports that need to be opened, and those are very important for make sure you have an efficiently running cluster. So these two things are now uh, something we have to manage. And then finally with storage, uh, with Kubernetes, originally it was for stateless workloads, meaning I don't care, here's some block storage, get to it. And stateless uh, applications like a web, web application, something like that are great. I mean, that's a fantastic Kubernetes use case. However, with Cassandra, you know <laughs> that ephemeral is not okay. And when we deploy a Cassandra node, there is some stickiness to that. The IP address is sticky in the cluster. Gossip wants to keep track of that IP address. And the data that's on the disk is really important. It's not like you can just delete the disk and be okay unless you want to repair something in your cluster. So Cassandra has a different notion of what a node is compared to Kubernetes. So here's some, those are things we need to take care of. So I'm going to go into a little bit of how we want to make it work. Um, this is because you may be watching this in the future. This is as of September 2020, and um, it is subject to change. It could change this week, um, and that's great. We're moving fast as a, as a community, and there's a lot of really cool stuff happening around Cassandra and Kubernetes. Operator, let's start at the basic unit of making it work. All those challenges I mentioned before about networking, topology, storage, um, we can mitigate a lot of those with a great operator. You could think of an operator as, I love this, um, Raghu from Yelp had this great quote. He's like, "It's think of it as a robot in your data center. It just runs around taking care of things for you. It's this automation. And in this case, it's translating what Cassandra can do to Kubernetes and vice versa. So when Kubernetes says, I would like to deploy some nodes and cluster, I need to deploy a cluster, it's translating that desire into an action that is Cassandra, uh, Cassandra right-sized. So for things like node provisioning and node placement, replacement, um, getting, you know, ditching an old node and replacing it is a, it's kind of a, uh, a specific operation to Cassandra. And if Kubernetes had its way, it would just replace the node immediately. And um, that's not exactly what we want to do. But operators are, are right now the way that it's make, we're making this work. As it sits today, we really have two main contenders for um, operators that are out there. Um, and these are both very, you know, they're very strong. And this is part of our community is where we, where we have some good ideas that are out there. And so I'm just gonna cover both of these or just talk about both these versus CASCOP. <clears throat> this is by the team at Orange in France. And um, they have one called CASCOP. <clears throat> I have to give them mad props because they actually created an, a logo and it's cool. It's a little, you know, Kubernetes thing in the Cassandra eye. It's pretty cool. And then we have CAS operator from DataStax, um, which is primarily um, being used for running um, the Astra Cassandra's or service. No logo. What's up? Come on. All right. So there's there's a hit right there. But um, both of these are in right now. In this, there's discussions going on in the dev list about uh, donating this code. Uh, just stay tuned. They're both really good operators for the things that they do. If you were to take a Venn diagram, there would be a whole lot of similarity with a very little amount of difference. And that's and that's when you realize, okay, we have a potential way out of this. But what, a, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is CAS operator, because that's the one I know the most. And you can roughly translate most of what I say into CASCOP as well, because they, they uh, accomplish the same kind of task. So the first thing that we have to start with when we're deploying Kubernetes and Cassandra or Cassandra in Kubernetes um, is the container because Kubernetes is container orchestration. You got to have something to orchestrate, right? Well, in particular, in the particular case with CAS operator, we actually, uh, because, and I'll get to this later about some of the things that need to change at Cassandra to make it more Kubernetes ready. Um, we, we bundled a management API um, in with um, the Cassandra node itself in the container. And the reason doing that is because that's a better way, that's a, a easier way to talk to Kubernetes. Kubernetes likes to talk in APIs, like a REST call, do this, do that. And um, <laughs> those of you who've had the, uh, been running Cassandra for a while, <clears throat> you know what the, you know how to configure your Cassandra cluster. 
by using JMX, which is an, a far superior way. No, it's not. Um, but JMX is kind of the way we do things. And that's, uh, that's not anything in the Kubernetes world that they're willing to even ad adopt. So we should just move on. So a in the world, and I'm, I'm going to go through some terminology, and um, I apologize if you know nothing about Kubernetes. I'll try to just kind of give you the TLDR. But there's some overlapping technology that is completely, or terminology, that is completely different from each other, but kind of mean the same thing. So in this case, like when we talk about a pod, what is a pod besides a group of whales? Well, it's a group of apps <laughs> or a group of state uh, stateful services. And uh, it in the, the Cassandra node, as we understand it, is what we translate into a, a Kubernetes pod. So that has the container, the storage, and the network. So this is, think of it as almost like the, what you would expect to roll out in like a cloud image or an AMI or something like that. Here's all the stuff that I need, an IP address with some block storage that has my data. Um, and all of that gets created as part of the Kubernetes experience, but it has to be done in a way that Cassandra will accept that. A um, couple of terms in here, um, in storage in, in Kubernetes land, um, they use these things called persistent volumes. And in order for you to use that, you have to create a, per a persistent volume claim. So that's what you see at the PVC PV, persistent, persistent volume claim on a persistent volume, which basically means you're just calling dibs on it. And it keeps other nodes from ever do using them. So the stateful set, um, it's not the newest thing in Kubernetes, but it is pretty new. And it was brought about by the fact that Kubernetes was really built around stateless. Um, so we don't really care if the IP comes and goes, the storage comes and goes. So <clears throat> when, we, when we build stateful applications, there's this list of things that we don't want to change. And that's what a stateful set is. Um, deploying Kubernetes with stateful sets allows us to have some assurances. So I know that this is the disk that I'm going to get. If, if the compute side dies, I know I'm going to get the disk back. <clears throat> Persistent volume claim. If the IP dies, I know that I'm going to be able to set it up again. So these stateful sets are really critical for stateful workloads like Cassandra. So what we've done is we've used stateful sets to create like a rack. Um, like in a, when you deploy, let's say, an AMI in a cloud, <clears throat> you know that that the stateful set to a rack is like an availability zone to a rack. Um, this gives uh, Cassandra some, some input on where the data placement is. That's, that's the rack awareness of a Cassandra node or Cassandra cluster so that you don't have any overlaps in your data or weird things. So the whole, if you go back, like why was rack awareness important? Well, what if you pulled a power plug on an entire rack of equipment? All right, that means that situation, how do you manage that? It's the same data center, but you wiped out a rack. That means that potentially you're not going to lose any data. Like we're not going to overlap uh, token ranges inside the same rack. Just It's just an availability feature. So we're mapping that rack to a stateful set. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> to deploy, we have this custom resource. And um, so you can be cool in, in Kubernetes land, you can call it a CRD. Just say that and everyone's like, oh, yeah, CRD. And the CRD, um, and the custom resource that you are creating, in this case with Cassandra, is the configuration for the uh, for the cluster and for the nodes themselves. But you're just telling it to cookie cutter that placement all over. If you see like what we've got here, uh, for instance, we specify the server version, 3.11.6. How many of these in the cluster do we need? Here's some configuration, like num tokens. Um, this is a major lifesaver. This is where Kubernetes starts getting really useful because now, and I know we've done this plenty with other things, but at least you have this in Kubernetes and it does a different way of, of enforcing this, um, it, which is declare my infrastructure and deploy it. So let's go through, this is a startup sequence. So I said, I wanna create this, uh, this cluster. Here's how it walks through it. So in this case, it creates the stateful sets first. So we need to create a place. And these are like the racks, like I said. Um, it provisions each one of the pods. And those are your individual nodes. 
Now, each one of these are off at this point. So the stateful set being the rack, now we have nodes sitting inside of them called pods. So stateful set, pods. That Cassandra pod, again, is just this part where now we have storage and networking. Just a, just a quick review. We also have it set up so that it's um, it will do the monitoring as well. So here we go. We provision those pods. And what happens is we start that first one and it will start them in order. This is where an operator comes in very handy because Kubernetes just says, go do it. And let's say that you're starting an Nginx server. It would just try to start all of them. It doesn't really think about like, well, there's an order to this. Or as we all know in Cassandra land, it's not as important <laughs> sometimes to, um, well, you. I would say it's, let me rewind that. It's important for you to just not bomb an entire cluster and start it all at the same time. Um, you will get interesting results. I've done it. It's kind of fun to do it. So, you know, try it sometime. But the Cassandra um, Cassandra noses are coming up, come up in order across the stateful sets. So across those racks, and then in the next line down the order. So it's starting to create this cluster in a very predictable and useful way. So remember this? Yeah, we just, this is a big deal. Now we have declarative infrastructure that is enforced. So if something goes wrong, Kubernetes is gonna try to fix it. That's our little robot. The operator is gonna be out there working on it. But also let's say we wanna make some changes. One of the, this is, this is what separates the, uh, the real admins from the noobs is a rolling upgrade. What happens if you want to upgrade Cassandra? Now we know Cassandra does online upgrades, but how do we do that in Kubernetes? Easy. You update the configuration. Let's say I want to bump the version from 11.6 to 11.7. No problem. Change that. Use kubectl, which is the command line tool. Um, there's other ways to do this, but let's go old school and do a command line. You, you submit that new configuration, and now that's the new state of the cluster as Kubernetes, Kubernetes sees it. And Kubernetes is like, I'm on it. And this is where it starts interfacing with the operator and starts making those changes. And the operator's job is to keep Kubernetes from just turning off your entire cluster, updating all the pods at once, and bringing it back online. That is not an online way of doing things. So when, when I think of... Um, this robot doing the right thing, it's doing what we would do. Terminates a single pod, brings it back, uh, turns it, um, replaces it with the new configuration. So we get a, a brand new version of Cassandra. Um, it starts up again. And then when it's back online, then it walks through, whoops. Then it walks through those. So let me try to wrap things up a little bit here. And I'm trying to leave at least a little bit of time for questions on here. Um, when we talk about cloud native Cassandra, it's not that we're trying to find a new way to run Cassandra. I don't think that's that's just the that's a good reason, maybe, but it's not the reason. Um, and as I talk to folks that are running Cassandra now and they're also running Kubernetes, I am not advocating anyone to just go out there and and replace the way you run your Cassandra clusters with Kubernetes right away. That I think that's a really bad idea. It's not good engineering. What I what I am um, offering is that this is a time to start thinking about how we make our lives easier in the in the future. And so, when you're deploying a new Cassandra cluster, what would make it easier for you in the long run? And when we talk about um, cloud native Cassandra, we're going to um, think about it in terms of, I want the whole application stack to be managed by the whole the entire control plane with the three things, like the dynamic, scalable, self-healing, everything should be on the same page. And that's that means adding the database that can do that. And we all know Cassandra does dynamic, scalable, and self-healing like crazy. So anything you work, work on or deploy, think of it in cloud native terms as it has infinite storage and compute. So future, oh, I see, I already see questions about, <laughs> thank you. 
Here we go. I'm glad you asked about multi-region. <laughs> this is, I remember I said networking is one of the problems. Um, you're, you're right. And uh, because Kubernetes really it was designed around your Kubernetes cluster is an island. And, you know, it's like you have to really, you have to have a note from your mom. Uh, you have to have a DNA sample just to get into it. I mean, it's really tough to get into a Kubernetes cluster. I don't know if you've ever tried it. And for reasons, you know, I like the default secure. Great. However, we all know that Cassandra does not survive as an island. It, it loves to be spread around the world. Multi-data center, it was from day one with Cassandra. It's not only Cassandra that has this, but there's a couple of projects that are coming that are really interesting. Um, Nate, you nailed it on the head, like these ACL hell. Yeah. Um, we should be able to configure these things in a way that is declarative as well. Um, so network service mesh is a project in the CNCF. Um, it does layer two as well as layer three. So thinking of layer two is like all the way down to like MPLS. Those are the really down there, but Seb Mariner is another project, which um, I think is a little lighter, but that's layer three, and that's using things like encrypted VM, uh, VPN tunnels. Um, these are cluster Kubernetes cluster to Kubernetes cluster, and as you deploy your Kubernetes environment, um, you just build in this multi data center from the beginning and, and make it declarative. Um, it it keeps you from having to do, and this is the same reason you'd want to run Cassandra and Kubernetes. It keeps you from having six things to manage or three things to manage when you deploy a cluster. You should have the same control plane controlling all of it so you can declare it, store the configuration and then get, test it in your CI CD. All of those things should happen for you. Uh, some changes to Cassandra. Um, and this is just a short list, but I think that there's, this has been consensus that I've heard in many places. And I'm, this is a very short list. I'm sure there's plenty of other things, but um, this has been a real call by the Cassandra community is like, instead of using JAMX, can we use API based management? There is a sidecar project, uh, in the, there's a CEP one. Um, but I think this is, this is a important part of making Cassandra more ready for what Kubernetes can do and other things is using an API based management, uh, usually in HTTP based API, um, external config management. Uh, the, the configuration mapping and things that happen inside of Kubernetes, um, you know, it stores, like I said, that single source of truth for configuration. And the way you configure a Cassandra node is with a YAML file. Well, if there was some way that we could we could block that state into the Kubernetes replacing, um, ooh. And Fred asked this question, replacing a Cassandra YAML with etcd, maybe, or at least some parts of it. And uh, where do we put the source of truth? And that, I think that's I think that's going to be a longer, harder question, but it makes sense when you're talking about having a single control plane because now you, instead of having to manage YAML files as well as your deployment YAML, that's a lot of YAML. Um, how can we make this easier? Uh, decoupling networking and storage, uh, not networking from storage, but the networking from Cassandra and storage from Cassandra, finding ways that we can make it so it's more uh, like this whole thing with persistent volume claims and persistent volumes. I mean, ah, there's um, there's some really interesting projects out there. Uh, Open EBS is one that um, they talk about local, uh, these local volumes. Um, there's uh, some, I think some, discussion around all these different things around storage, especially with data that are, I think, because now we're starting to do more data in Kubernetes, the, re the, the realization is storage. And I would really prefer it that we have a data storage primitive inside of Kubernetes instead of just storage. I think it, it declares the class properly. Uh, same thing with networking. There is some cool stuff happening in networking land um, where the, the networks, because of the way that the Kubernetes router works, it puts latencies and hops and things like that. Um, but in Cassandra, if we were able to plug into like the container native, um, uh, the container networking uh, things directly, I think there's some chance that we could get 
a lot better speed, throughput, et cetera. It is a huge area of study. And finally, Cassiner, CNI, thank you. <laughs> um, and containers is a full first class. Um, you know, that's not been something that the Cassandra project has really um, fronted. It's like this is our preferred container. Um, right now, Docker pretty much runs the container or is the source of truth. Docker, the company, maintains the Cassandra image. Um, but oh, I've had some great conversations. Um, Joey and I have had this conversation a few times about, you know, we should have better containers for things in Cassandra that are that are uh, form fit to something like, uh, you know, development and deploying it in different areas. Um, and containers, if I think we all, can we just agree containers are how we deploy infrastructure now, mostly, and they're tarballs or we should just let them go away like the dinosaurs they are. <laughs> um, so that those are some of the changes that are to Cassandra. And there's, there's actually some stuff that's happening there. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Fred. <laughs> All right, get off my lawn. All right, so I would also invite everyone to wrapping up here, Cassandra community effort, which is happening right now. I mentioned, you know, there's there is this two operators that are probably the strongest contenders, but we really would like to get it down to something where we can have a better, like here's one that we all work on. I, I still feel like there's a, there's a, a world out there for that. Um, and closer alignment to the Apache Cassandra project. Um, the uh, <laughs> Dinesh, no, they're not tarballs. <laughs> um, but having them close to each one of these, um, like when we deploy Cassandra project, we're thinking about Kubernetes and the operator is in alignment with that, like just like a driver or anything else. I think that's a really good thing. So we have um, we have a couple of things. We have the Apache, uh, if you go to the ASF Slack, there's the Cassandra Kubernetes. We invite you to join us there. and um, we also have the Cassandra Wiki, which you can go there anytime. No one ever does, but you could try. Be be original. Um, we have a whole bunch of resources on there, like all the past meetings we've had, notes from all those meetings. Um, the SIG is two things: is uh, like get trying to get a common operator, but there's also discussions about running Cassandra in Kubernetes as well. So it's kind of dual purpose. Uh, ideally, in my mind, I would love to have that turn into just running Cassandra and Kubernetes, I'm not talking about building an operator. Just, I think, because we're at the point probably after 4.0 where this will be a, new, a real big focus for the project is um, having people actually run Kubernetes um, or Cassandra and Kubernetes. I think that's all I have for right now. Yes, the big thank you slide. Um, so I'd be happy to take any questions or, you know, um, Joey can make an ironic comment or something, but. <laughs> oh, Dinesh, see, Dinesh has got it all sorted out. <laughs> wow, see, this is what it's like. This is almost like being in person, where I get heckled, and then Dinesh just drops the mic, says, there you go, done. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad I made the effort of creating this deck. <laughs> um. Good question. Are we planning to build a new operator? God, I hope not. Um, I Like I said, there's a lot of overlap between operators. If you get into an operator, there's not a ton of, it, it, it's not an amazing amount of code. It's a whole lot of boilerplate that has to get created and mapped. That's probably the best way to put it. So I would hope that we can come together at least on something. Um, this is, you know, this is an open source project. We we have to have a lot of debate and a lot of uh, back and forth. If you look on the dev mailing list right now, there's actually activity happening on there today. Um, yes, there's going to be a fight in the parking lot. What? That is not a pandemic-friendly way to do things, Nate. That's not how we do things. We're going to meet. We're going to play uh, Team Fortress, right? Yeah, <laughs> virtually. <laughs> so we're going to meet in T TF. We're going to have a duke it out. Yeah, Nerf guns at six feet. So we'll see. <laughs> but um, I th one of the things I'd really love to be able to see is more operators. Um, we had Bloomberg, DreamWorks, New Relic show up early early on. I'd love to see more input from operators. Like this is the way we'd want it to be. So, yeah. 
All right. Look into the comments besides Fight Club. <laughs> oh, can operators run cross cluster? Yes. Uh, well, the operators can communicate if you give them the IP. It's there's actually um, boy, this is, it got me flat footed. I did see a post in there how to run uh, multi data center Kubernetes. Um, there you go. So we. I'll have to I'll have to dig it up, but yes, it's doable. Uh, Submariner would be a good choice because you're creating a VPN tunnel, basically, so you're flattening out your network in a lot of ways or routing it. Um, it do not try to do this with service mesh. It, it just doesn't work the way. Um, yes, uh, Dinesh, I am also part of the CNCF Technical Oversight Committee, and um, also a part of this thing called Data and Kubernetes. Uh, community. Um, this is beginning to be a thing. It's interesting because a lot of the storage vendors are the ones that are making a thing out of it. Fine. Um, but it is uh, starting to get transmitted over to the Kubernetes. The CNCF is like, uh, staple workloads need a big overhaul. And it's just this. Oh, <laughs> open source Tupperware. <sighs> See, I shouldn't be watching the chat. <laughs> So um, I think, um, yeah, next up is Eric Ramirez. If you, if you want to know everything you did wrong, Eric is the guy to help you. He probably, he helps the most people every day. So you should go watch his session right now. Um, I'm going to say goodbye. See you in the next session. Um, maybe I'll see you on Slack. If you want to talk more to me about it, if you want to get on a Zoom call, I'm happy to hash it out. But you know where to find me. I'm here. So see you later, everyone.